Brother Gene Hill was born in New Richmond, Ohio, and brought up in Dayton, Ohio area. He served for years in the U.S. Navy and was honorably discharged. He and his wife, Jerry, that's what it says. He and his wife, Jerry, were married in August 1974, honorably. They are the proud parents of one son, Justin. He and his wife, Shannon, have one son, Connor, two granddaughters, Brenna and Evelyn, and are expecting another grandchild this year. Gene has preached for congregations in Florida, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now, if we do that right, we say Louisiana and Mississippi. Gene is a 1978 graduate of the Florida School of Preaching under the director of B.C. Carr. Gene is currently preaching for the Indianola Church of Christ in Indianola, Mississippi. He and G Jerry have been there since 2007. We've had Gene to speak with us uh, on the program several times. Glad he can be with us today. And he's going to be speaking on the subject of the fatal error on the nature and purpose of miracles. Gene, can speak to us, please. Good morning. Appreciate y'all being here and appreciate this opportunity. I, yeah. Um, first time I ever spoke here, I, one, of the, one of the things that I really appreciate about this is you're, you're meeting men that you hadn't known before, never seen before. I and mean, you'd followed their, their uh, bulletin articles and things like that and, and you know, never met Johnny Oxendine before. And, uh, and I found out he was speaking. I said, well, so, you know, please introduce me. Now, uh, of course, glad handing him. I'm standing up here now. Nobody knew who Gene Hill was at that time. Now you know more than what you really want to know. But uh, I was talking about that, and I said, no, I'd, I'd never met Brother Oxendine before, and uh, I was glad to see him. And I, I said, when I shook his hand, I was kind of surprised. And it got real quiet. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't think he'd be as tall as he was. <laughs> but anyways, it's an honor to speak here, and, and the, these lectures are more important than, than what we can really appreciate even now, as important as we understand them to be in years, years from now. I, I mean, I have books on my shelf that, that are probably 75 to 100 years old, at least that. And sometime 100 years from now, somebody's going to pick up one of these books, and it's going to be the book they need. And so the, the, the job that we have before us is extremely important. My task, as David announced, is the fatal error on the nature and purpose of miracles. Now, given that the Bible is the plenary verbally inspired revelation of God's mind to mankind as discussed in another lecture in this series, then whenever the Bible, whatever the Bible teaches regarding miracles and, and miraculous events as recorded within its pages is the truth. And we have to abide by it. Man is obligated to accept that teaching and correctly and properly order his life in harmony with that truth. I don't have to like it. It's my obligation to accept it and submit to it and then get my mind around what it teaches and make it part of me. And, of course, we're going to come to love it after a while. It, it takes time and effort sometimes. The Bible does teach on miracles and miraculous events. And very profound doctrine is, is revealed for us by which we are able to be reassured about the future and eternity. And the nature of the miraculous, and the premise of this lesson is that the miraculous is over with, that assures us that what we have is exactly what we need, and that's all we need to, in order to conduct our affairs today. The need for such a study as this is readily apparent, and it's crucially important when we see the many and varied religious groups that profess Christ and claim some modern manifestation of miracles while asserting that such manifest manifestations validate their many and conflicting religious doctrines. Just look at the field that's out there. Consider the claims of such Pentecostal groups as the Assemblies of God, the United Pentecostal Church, as Jerry ably mentioned a few moments ago, and the various denominational groups appearing in the Mormon religion. A number of years back, I, I purposely studied the Mormon religion and I had a meeting with some Mormon elders, as they call themselves. And they were younger then than I was at the time. And they were still elders. And, and one of the things I found out at that time, in the mid to late 80s, there is at least seven different groups in Mormonism. 
And these two young men didn't know that, and I was glad to inform them of it. But each of these groups claim guidance and inspiration by the Holy Spirit, and each group holds contradictory positions from the others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, particularly verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and as in all churches of the saints. Now the assemblies of God claim that there are three distinct personalities in the Godhead. Again, as Jerry mentioned, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. The United Pentecostal Church denies three distinct personalities make up the Godhead. And again, uh, Jerry discussed this quite a lot. Their claim is that there is only one spiritual being, God, but he functions through, and I'm quoting, three offices, roles, or relationships to humanity. The Mormon view of God is that the Heavenly Father and the Son are, this is stunning, are glorified physical beings and that each member of the Godhead is a separate being. Now that's, that's what they say. The importance of this divergence of belief is crucial as all three claim guidance by the Holy Spirit in a direct manner. Quoting again, His communication to our spirit carries far more certainty than any communications we can receive through our natural senses. In other words, you can't read the Bible and get much out of it. Now that's what the Latter-day Saints claim, the Mormons. Another, the Assemblies of God fellow, says next week is Pentecost Sunday. Quoting now, we will celebrate the coming of the Spirit, the helper our Lord promised would empower his followers to be his witnesses in the world. And Johnny discussed that quite a lot, and very well too. As with his first followers, we desperately need the supernatural working of the Spirit to accomplish God's purposes in our lives. Well, that's just stunning. United Pentecostal quote, there are two major evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The initial outward evidence is speaking with tongues, which means speaking miraculously in language the speaker does not know. And that's not incorrect in and of itself. But he goes on and says, speaking in tongues also indicates the complete control of the Spirit over our, you and me, our human wills. The tongue is the most unruly part of the body, James 3 and verse 8, and it's being tamed by God as evidence of his complete control. In other words, you can't help yourself. You have to have somebody come in and guide that thing. Well, no, that's correct too, but not in the way they specify. Because they've already said, I can't understand the scripture unless I have help. With such divergent views on the makeup and character of the Godhead, all the while claiming guidance of the Holy Spirit, by what are we to be guided for assurance? Who are we to believe? I had the Mormon elders. I said, well, what if, and I, I gave this example to them of the Holy Spirit, the Assemblies of God, the United Pentecostals, and the Mormon Church. I said, if I get this burning in my heart that you talk about, and I agree with the Assemblies of God, what do I do? You just pray some more. Well, I finally got tired of praying and walked away. But to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah says, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Now, one of the things I like to do when I'm talking with people and we talk about the miraculous and faith, and I say, I, I want to tack biblical onto the front of it. I say, when I'm talking about faith, I'm talking about biblical faith. When I'm talking about the miraculous, I'm talking about the biblically miraculous. In talking about the miracle, miraculous, we must first understand what it is we are discussing. Many talk about the miracle of birth as if the birth itself is a miraculous event. We would answer that the creation of Adam from the dust of the ground in Genesis 1:26 was miraculous, but that the ongoing process of procreation is entirely natural. Again, Genesis 1 and verse 28. It is granted that some were able to conceive only after God's blessings. Again, Genesis 16, 17, and 18, those three chapters. But the process of conception and birth was entirely natural. God opening up the wombs. It has been such since creation with the exception of Jesus and his conception being truly a miracle. Now, I don't know how the Holy Spirit worked when he overshadowed Mary. I reckon he knew how to do it. And it happened. Now, some even use the word miracle to describe events that are really only extraordinary occurrences. And this is when you finally press them, they say, well, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We've all heard the accounts of folks that would have been on the plane that crashed, but for a last-minute change in plan, I would have been on that plane. 
a misconnection, a car breakdown, or some other mundane event that prevented the fatal connection. You've heard her even said, it was a miracle he wasn't hurt. Or it was miraculous, he only got hurt no more than what he did. So what is under consideration is a set of circumstances that some may deem as lucky and are truly wonderful in their outcome, which do not make up, much less define, the truly miraculous event. So what is a miracle? Now speaking from some class notes, I'm glad I took good notes when I did. But a miracle is an interference with nature by supernatural power, according to C.S. Lewis. Another quote is an event which never could have been the result of the working of the laws of nature as we understand them, but is of such, but is of such extraordinary character that it requires for its cause the intervention of a supernatural being. That is, an event which cannot be accounted for by naturalistic cause, according to Wilbur Smith. Still quoting, an event or a fact in the physical world deviating from the known laws of nature or transcending our knowledge of those laws. That's just Webster in his dictionary. A miracle is the unresisting activity of God which, is at, other time, which at other times hides and conceals itself behind, behind the veils of, um, of which we term natural laws, but in the, in the miracle unveils itself. It, it steps out from concealment and the hand which is laid bare and I, I did not make note of where I got that quote and finally supernatural power working separate and apart from natural law numericals are not a greater manifestation of God's power than those ordinary and ever repeated processes raising the dead requires no greater power than the power to give life in the first place multiplying the loaves and fishes required no greater power than the power to create or to give life in the beginning Restoring one's health requires no greater power than giving life and health in the first place. Miracles are above and beyond and not contrary to nature. Health isn't contrary to nature. Sickness is contrary to nature. So what are they called? They're called wonders, Mark chapter 2 and 12. Again, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. That which is astonishes the beholder, a miracle is an astonishing event with the beholder, which the beholder cannot trace to any known law. That fell in the synagogue when Jesus said, you had the withered hand, put forth your hand. We've all seen somebody with, that's had a stroke and her hand is all balled up or had some other issue and that, and that hand just atrophies and the muscles. And Jesus said, "Extend, let, show forth, your, let me see your hand. And that's all he said. He didn't do anything. His hand, the man just went like that and he extended his hand and it was made whole and everybody looked at Jesus. Now, they understood that. They understood where it came from. And they recognized something wonderful had been done. They are called signs, Mark 16 and 20. As a sign, the miracle indicates the near presence and working of God. As a sign, miracles are valuable not as much for what they are as for what they indicate of the grace and power of the doer or of the connection in which he stands with a higher power or world. Jesus said, I don't do this of myself. The Father gives me this power. Well, I gave it to myself, right, Jerry? That's right. The Jews asked Jesus for a sign, John 2 and 18. The miracles of the apostles were signs, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. The sign given by the young prophet of the rending of the altar and the spilling of the ashes was given to Jeroboam in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Kings 13. They are called powers and mighty works or deeds, Acts 6 and verse 8. The expression denotes power and our attention is directed to the cause which produced the miracle. G and and, and um, Peter with the eleven said he worked miracles and signs and wonders among you as ye yourselves know. You folks were standing there watching these things take place. It is translated wonderful works, mighty works, and frequently miracles. Now observe that wonder, sign, and power are all used in the healing of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2. The miracle was a wonder because those who saw were amazed. And wouldn't you be amazed? We've all seen people with polio, all of us that are older. I've had friends that were afflicted with polio when they were much younger. We've seen that. And if, if their limbs had been made whole, we would have been astounded. It was a sign because it gave evidence that one greater than man was among them. The miracle was a power because the man at Jesus' word arose. Wouldn't you be amazed when that young man on that funeral bier sat up? When the rock was rolled back and Lazarus came forth under his own power, wouldn't you be amazed? Oh, we'd be stunned. So what about the purpose then? 
Probably the most important effect was to create faith, John chapter 4 and verse 46. And again, John chapter 20, many, many other things did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that ye may believe. All I have to do is open up the text and read the words and take them in their everyday meanings, just common rules of grammar, unless there's something in the text. For instance, when Jesus called Herod a fox, was Herod a little four-legged animal with black feet and long pointy nose and a bushy tail? Well, no. So what did he mean? Cunning, skulked around, sneaky. So we can understand what it says. The miraculous confirm the spoken word. They, they have testified to the authenticity of God's truth and validity of his servants in every age. God's word was confirmed by creation, the voice of God and the flaming sword. It was confirmed by miracles in Egypt, wilderness and the dividing of the Red Sea, at Sinai and the Jordan River and miracles in Canaan during, during the Jewish age. In the Christian age, God's word was confirmed by Christ, his apostles and others, Acts chapter 19 and 6. Miracles were to assure men of their faith, Luke chapter 7 and verse 20. Must we look for somebody else? Or are you the one? And Jesus told John's disciples, you go back and tell him what you've seen. They were given because of the weakness of man's faith and not because of any weakness of God's word. God's word still said what it said. Now they'd just seen a miracle. God's word is true whether anyone believes it or not. Such were the credentials for the bearer in order that he might know that he had a special mission from God. Romans chapter 15 and 9. The miracles of Jesus also provided credentials for his Messiahship. He opened the eyes of the blind in John chapter 9. Uh, fulfillment of prophecy, Isaiah 42 and 7. Proclaimed liberty to the captive. Those are what miracles are all about. And that is clear from the foregoing material that the miracles performed a very clear and necessary part in the production of what we refer to as the Holy Bible. Inspiration discussed in another chapter is also part of the miraculous activity of God. In that chapter was discussed how God through the medium of the Holy Spirit used the intellect and vocabulary of the individual mind of various ones to communicate to mankind his mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 beginning. Now in that passage, that's an amazing passage. In that passage, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, you first have the revelation. Think of that as an information dump. God says, here's everything I want you to know. And pff, there it was. And now, here are the words that you're going to use from your own vocabulary to express exactly what I want these folks to understand. And he gave them the words. That's inspiration. Every knowledge, and, and you know, we've got the mind of God. Think about that, friends. We've, we, in, this, in this right there, I have the mind of an almighty God and I can access it anytime I choose to. And anything that's in there for me to know, I can read and understand. Now, it might take me a while to, to figure out some of that stuff, but I can learn it and I can know it. Every knowledgeable Bible student, faithful Christian, and preacher of the gospel believes in miracles and miraculous. I do. I don't think... That, I'd be surprised to learn if any one of our brethren here this morning doesn't believe in miracles and miraculous. I mean, just listen to the sermons you've already heard so far today and last night, and you would understand that at least those of us that have spoken so far believe in the miraculous. Um, the problem arises when the Bible is not properly studied and understood contextually. When it is stated that the Bible teaches that the reason for and the age of the miraculous is past and such is no longer needed or appropriate, those that believe and think otherwise are seemingly incensed. I've had people get really up, upset with me when I say the age, I don't believe in miracles today. Now, I mean, I, today I still believe in miracles, but not for today. It is a premise of this material that it is not a matter of the existence of miracles, but rather the perpetuation of the miraculous age that is firmly denied. We just don't need them today. The power of God is not denied in such a claim. The question is in reality whether or not God has continued to exercise that power and we insist that he has not. Now, such a claim does not deny God's providential hand in the affairs of men. I'm, I'm convinced. You know, I, there's, it's one of these things. I don't have a book, chapter, and verse for it, but I, I just have to say that my wife and I getting married is a providential hand of God. I mean, the first time I was engaged in the Navy would have been a disaster for me. The second time would have been a disaster for her. And I'm honest about that. And, of course, my wife still 
trying to figure out what it is for her, but I'm happy with it. And I don't know how we even, you know, if, I don't know. Here we stand. It does not also deny his ongoing daily care. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 40, 45, his reigns fall on the just and the unjust. Acts chapter 14, 17, he's not left himself without witness in that he has allowed the reins to fall on us. Much less deny his answering of prayers. 1 John chapter 5, 14, why would, why would the apostle Paul covet the prayers of the brethren? Pray for me. Why? That a door may be opened up. We need to pray for ourselves and our brethren that a door may be opened up. Lord, find us Cornelius. Guide me to Cornelius. He's out there. Obviously not him, literally, of course. But such thing God handles through natural laws, whereas regarding the miraculous, as has been pointed out, natural law is suspended or superseded in the performance of the supernatural act. Now, miracles were of great value, but are not needed today. They didn't teach new doctrine nor explain any doctrine already taught, but confirmed doctrine of God, Mark 16 and verse 20. Miracles didn't make truth more truthful, but confirmed truth more fully. Again, John chapter 20 and verse 30. Such caused some to believe the truth, but didn't cause all who saw to believe. Acts chapter 2 verse 14. Notice that all those folks on the day of Pentecost heard the same message, and some of them gladly received it, which describes just how a certain small group of those that received it and heard it and were called responded to it. Not everybody responded exactly the same. Only 3,000 gladly received the, the word. How do you know? Because it says that, and they were baptized. Only the gladly receptive. Not all of the receptive. They all heard it. The auditory nerves vibrated in everybody. What is this that we hear? These men speaking in our language. Did they not hear the language? They certainly did. But only 3,000 3, out of that great, that great audience responded appropriately. Miracles and signs followed apostles to confirm the word. The signs including the laying on of the apostles' hands were given uh, to give the miraculous powers to others. Acts chapter 8, 14 and other passages. All miracles ceased when the word of God was revealed and confirmed. Again, we'll look at this a little bit more. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8 and following. Signs and miracles claimed to be performed by people today are only false miracles. They are liars and they are thieves. And on the day of judgment, I'm, I'm going to be interested in hearing their explanation. What were you thinking? My dad used to ask me that. What were you thinking? And don't say I don't know. I was in trouble. I had no clue. I was a teenager. There's no excuse for these men. A brief case for Bible inspiration, the importance of an infallible revelation, is seen in the statement of Jesus in John chapter 12, verse 44. But notice verse 48 and following. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, if it is the case that the word spoken by Jesus will, Jesus will be the standard for judgment on that great day, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat. Then it is also the case that we must have a dependable record of the words of Jesus to assure our soul's eternal home that we, that we heard about in the word of the gospel. Now if I don't have a standard rule book by which I can open up, which I can open up and by which I can assure myself that what, that, uh, what I'm doing is correct or what I need to fix, if I don't have that, then I don't have a clue. And we have a right to be afraid when we're about ready to draw our last breath. I stood in the hospital room of a man that was dying and he knew it. And I saw his wife. I was going down the, the, the hallway in the hospital to the room and I saw this lady come out and I introduced myself. I'm his wife. And she says, she says uh, he should be asleep. I said, why? They just gave him a shot 30 minutes ago that would knock a horse over the way she described it. I went in and I said, well, what's his issue? She says, he's afraid to die. He's afraid to go to sleep because he won't wake up. He'll die. What a, and there's nothing I could say to him. I mean, so I, but I went in and talked with him and he literally had hold of the sides of the bed and that bed was just rattling. He was so afraid. 
afraid. He was not just a little afraid. He was, his teeth were clenched. He, was, he just, and I, and I was, just, I just had, I didn't know what else to say to them. I'd had nothing really, I was just dumbfounded myself. But, you know, we don't, as faithful Christians, we don't have to fear death. Nervous about it. I've never done it. I don't know anybody else has that can tell me about it. But I can be assured that as a faithful child of God, the angels are waiting to carry me to the bosom of Abraham. Why would I be afraid of that? That's the issue. That's what I'm taking comfort in. Now, Jesus assured his apostles that they would be given what they needed at the time it was needed and all that was necessary to preach his will. He's, he has he also promised another comfort of the spirit of truth, John 14, Jerry talked about, which is the Holy Ghost that would teach them all things, which are the epistles, and bring to their remembrance the things which Jesus said to them, the gospel accounts, John 14 and 26. In that same conversation, Jesus promised the spirit of truth would guide them, the apostles, unto all truth and show them things to come, John chapter 16, 13. Now, John 14, 15, and 16 is the night of the Last Supper, and it's just the 12, that will let the, eventually the 11 after Judas left, that were there to receive that promise. He was speaking to them. Context is crucial to understanding. Now, the clearly stated purpose of miracles, there is no ambiguity to biblical instruction regarding scriptural teaching about miracles. The first purpose of miracles was to prove that Jesus is deity or God, John chapter 1, John chapter 20 and verse 30, and Acts 2 and verse 22. The second purpose of miracles was to confirm God's word to those who heard. Again, Mark 16 and 20, he confirmed the word by the signs that followed. The third purpose of miracles was to verify a true apostle and Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, the marks of an apostle are these. So if anybody had those, he was one of them. The fourth purpose of the miracles was to fulfill prophecy, Matthew chapter 8, 17. Now since the miracles were to prove that Jesus is God, to confirm the scripture, verify a true apostle and fulfill prophecy, then the purpose and time of miracles were coming to an end 2,000 years ago. What more do we need? Illustration here. My wife goes on to online and orders a particular uh, washer dryer combination. I want this, these, th these uh, particular items on it. I want it to be able to do this. I want it this color and this size and all the particulars. And when she goes to check out online, she gets the serial number, the model number, the product number, the delivery number, the purchase order number, all the numbers they could possibly throw at her. And then she gives them our credit card number. So the day of delivery shows up, and these guys pull up in the truck, and they unload that thing, we check all the numbers, and we sign all the papers, and we exchange information and so forth, and, and we get that thing in the house. Tomorrow, another truck shows up with another washer-dryer combination. It can't be the same one. Now, we take donations, but it cannot be the same washer-dryer combination. Why? Because the numbers aren't going to match. If they do, there's something wrong, but we accept donations. So... So the thing is, is once it's been delivered, it doesn't need to be re-delivered. It's here. I've got it. There it is. When it's been delivered, I've got it, and here it is. I don't need it to be delivered again. What purpose would miracles serve today? Well, none. None. That doesn't prove to me somebody's trying to lie to me. To assert that since the purpose of miracles has been fulfilled based upon the material just presented would be sufficient, let us provide even more scriptural document documentation to further validate our premise. One of the purpose of, purposes of miracles was confirmatory. Now, Jeremiah prophesied of a new covenant which would supersede the old. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. And the fulfillment of that prophecy is in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Now, I enjoy pointing this out to my friends on Facebook. It stops the conversation. I mean, it, they, I just don't get any more responses after that to my point. In order to, about the covenants being changed, in order to establish authority, the messengers would need proof that God was with them. Mark 16, 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and here it is, 
and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, heard them, heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now why is that hard to understand? It's not if you have an open and honest mind and are at least willing to, to examine the evidence given. And that's the problem. As noted previously, the apostles were to be guided into all truth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. The manifestations of the signs and wonders bearing witness to the authenticity of the message and the genuineness of the preacher. And you go back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 5 when, when uh, um, uh, Philip went down to Samaria. And when they heard him preach and saw the miracles that he did, they believed and were baptized. It is correct to conclude that the purpose of the miraculous has been fulfilled and is therefore no longer needed. What more could they do for us today? Nothing. I don't need those things. Now, would it be amazing to watch? No question. They were amazed back then. Why do we think we'd be any less amazed? Probably more so because we don't know there's we know there's not a need for them anymore. The second line of proof that the miraculous age has passed and no longer needed is that the unity of faith has come. Now, you, you wouldn't. I hesitated to write that down because you wouldn't know that by looking at the brotherhood today. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 14. The Father was to send the Comforter after the ascension of Jesus. And again, it's been covered in detail already. Jesus did not uh, did ascend, and there are witnesses, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, and chapter 2 and verse 29, uh, Peter said we saw it. And those gifts did come. Again, as it was pointed out, when the power came, the Spirit came, Acts chapter 2. The power, the, promise, the power promised in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. It came in Acts chapter 2. When the power came, the Spirit came. When the Spirit came, the kingdom was to come. Now, Paul tells us to whom those gifts were to be given. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. We see also in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, those powers being bestowed on other men, as well as the purpose of the gifts themselves in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, that we might grow up in the maturity of the faith. This passage also informs us of the limited time of the gifts in verse, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith. When we've come to the unity of the faith, when it's been delivered to us and we've got it in our hot little hands that we can look at it ourselves, we no longer need the delivery vehicle. It's been delivered. The truck drives away. I've got the washer and dryer. I've got all that the, the Spirit wanted me to have. I don't need anything more. But we've got more to prove that. To we all come to unity of faith and a knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till is a time frame and the unity of the faith is the goal. The gifts were to last until the unity of the faith has come. Now has the unity of the faith come? Now since the Bible defines the faith as the completed gospel revelation, again John 14, 26 and some other, Jude verse 3, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, then the answer is yes, the completed revelation has come. Now since the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is complete, then the need for the miraculous has ceased, and therefore, when the last person to possess miraculous gifts passed away, then that age has ceased. Now, there's some that believe that when John dotted the last sentence of the book of Revelation, it stopped. That may well be the case. None of us knows for certain. And I, and I wouldn't argue against that. But the fact is, is it all came to a halt. Beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is answering a series of questions that the Corinthians had sent him, apparently, by the hands of the house of Clo, according to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 11. Now chapters 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians are dealing with spiritual gifts. Now, and he says that in chapter 12 and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, which, which are specifically mentioned in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 38, uh, 28. In verse 31, Paul admonishes them to seek the best gifts and then tells them of a more excellent way than the gifts, the spiritual gifts. I'm telling you all about these gifts. Now, now that I've told you all about those things which are important to you, let me tell you about something that's even better than that. That's more effective long term than those miraculous things. In chapter 13, the first seven verses, the apostle is contrasting the spiritual gifts with the way that is better, which is charity. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, he tells the brethren that charity never fails, but using prophecy, tongues, and knowledge for the whole of spiritual gifts tells them that the spiritual gifts will one day fail, cease, and vanish away. Now that's stunning in itself for folks who have never paid attention to it. Prophecy and knowledge in verse 9 stand in for the miraculous and are described as that which is in part. Now Thayer's defines part as in part, partially, partially, that is imperfectly. Paul contrasts the miraculous which is in part with that which is perfect in verse 10. Now Vines defines the word, Vines dictionary defines the word translated perfect as having reached its end, finished, complete, perfect, of things complete, perfect, and he cites Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 and 1 Corinthians 13 and 10, referring to the complete revelation of God's will and ways, whether in the completed scripture or in the hereafter, according to, again, Vines dictionary. Remember that the Spirit was to teach the apostles all things and cause them to remember all the words of Jesus, John 14 and 26. That he was to guide them into all truth and show them uh, things to come, John 16 and 13. Peter says that we have been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, 2 Peter 1, 3. Now let me, let me illustrate that for just a moment. The word all. I've got it. Let's just say I've got a leather. Those of you that are my age and older understand playing marbles. And if you played marbles, you had a leather bag or a bag at any rate. And let's just say in that bag of marbles, you had a hundred marbles. You have a wooden bowl over here and you pour all the marbles in that bag into the wooden bowl. All of them are in there. How many are in that, that, that wooden bowl? Would you say a hundred? There's a hundred. All of them are in that bowl. There are no marbles left in that bowl, in that bag, because all 100 marbles are in the bowl. Now, when Peter says that we, that we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, then I don't need, what else do I need? Jude talks of, um, talk, talks of the faith which was delivered unto the saints, Jude verse 3. Such being the case, then we no longer have a need for further revelation as the miraculous has accomplished its purpose. What else could be delivered that isn't already contained in the scriptures? If one refuses to heed the revelation we already possess, then why should we expect them to believe a miracle performed in their presence? There were folks that stood there and watched those miracles be delivered and still rejected it. Now when the, when the Sanhedrin saw that blind man stand before them, they believed he was born blind. They believed he could now see, but they didn't believe in the miracle giver. They didn't believe in who he was. He had the authority to say, I am the Son of God, and they rejected it. They brought condemnation on themselves. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. Those Pharisees brought condemnation on themselves and they rejected the testimony of God against themselves. Now, the fatal error on the nature and purpose of miracles is believing that there is still a place for the miraculous today. If we believe there is still a need, then we must believe that further revelation is still needed, which would make Peter at the best deluded and at the most a liar, for he said all things pertain to life and godliness has been delivered. Jude would be proven wrong in claiming the faith had been delivered. Satan won't be bound as claimed by John the Revelation letter, chapter 20 and verse 2. Given the claims of inspiration of the various religious groups whose core doctrines contradict that of the others, God would be the author of confusion, and on the day of judgment, none of us would know what we're going to be doing next. Is it a fatal error? It kills the soul. It damns the spirit. Souls will be in eternity in heaven, or in hell for an eternity simply because of false teachers like Benny Hinn and the rest of his craft. Brother David, how much time do I leave you? Oh, must be a miracle. <laughs> we appreciate so very much, Brother Gene, that good sermon on the fatal error on the nature and purpose of miracles. Many years ago, we had a regular daily radio program in Van Buren, Arkansas. The station was owned by a man who was very involved in Pentecostal activities. And there were a lot of that kind of 
preaching going on. We had our time from 11.30 to 15 to 12, Monday through Friday, and so we had a good listening audience, a good time. And I was doing a whole series of lessons on the design, purpose, and the end of miracles. And I drove back to the church building after I finished one day, and the phone rang about the time I got in the office. There was this very upset, at least the sound of her voice, elderly lady. And uh, she was very much wanting to give me her testimony that miracles still were going on as, they, as we read of in the New Testament. And uh, I said, you have miracles like Jesus' work, like the apostles' work. She said, yes. She said, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I said, um, well, I'm, well, I point out a number of things. We'll go through all of them regarding the purpose of miracles and the design of them, the end of them. And she did somewhat listen for a while, but then when I pointed out they had ended, she declared that I had a devil. I knew a number of my brethren would not have any hesitancy to agree with her. But nevertheless, I said, well, if I have a devil, you realize, don't you, uh, what we know from the Bible about demon possession, that it's not even me that's speaking. I don't even have control of myself. It's the, it's the devil that speaks. And if you have what Jesus and the apostles had through a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, then it's your obligation and authority, and if you love my soul, to cast out the demon. If not, you're going to be held accountable in the day of judgment because I can't control myself. You're, you're talking to a demon. You have the power to cast him out. You know they did in the Bible. Now cast him out. The only thing I got was a click buzz. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, that's the way to deal with, with these folks. The proof is in the doing of it. Uh, we laugh about this, but let's go to the cemetery. You tell them to get up, and I'll tell them to stay down. And we'll see who has the power. And that is one of the best ways, if not the best way I know, to try to show people that they don't have what they think they have. And then teach them the truth of the Bible on the design, purpose, and the end of miracles. And in fact, if you're debating them in a public debate, that's the only way you can, can do this. I heard, Brother, uh, many, many years ago, I, had, I don't think I was out of high school, Brother... Uh, D. Howard telling about in the 1930s when he was preaching in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And there was a black brother there who was uh, preaching for black congregation, was going to debate a Pentecostal preacher, and he came and asked Brother Howard to help him get things together. And, uh, of course, one of the passages they were going to use, to say still applicable today, is uh, Mark 16, uh, verses 17 through 20. These signs shall follow them that believe, and so forth. And uh, he was, of course, going to say, well, if you teach the first, uh, 15 to 16, why don't you teach the rest of it? So they said that what they did, they got together, they found a bottle that was green. And they had the skull and crossbones on it and poison and all this. So they mixed up a concoction and put it in there and uh, had buttermilk and honey and all sorts of stuff in it and said you'd shake it up, look through that green thing, said it looked terrible rolling in there. So they met to debate and they had the platform and these straight back cane bottom chairs is what they were sitting in. Of course, the Pentecostal preacher brought up immediately, if you believe Mark 16, 15, 16, then you believe the rest of it. If you believe that, you can believe the rest of it. If you believe that, you can believe the rest of it and pressed it on. So when the brother got up to answer him, he pulled out that bottle and said he would walk over to him and shake it in his face and said, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And said every time they'd do it, the guy, he had a Prince Albert coat, said he'd gather up those tails and scoop that chair back a little bit more every time. And that effectively shut down that particular matter. Now, Brother Wallace was a little more bold than that because in one of them he told me that he said, I actually had poison. And he said, don't you know, Brother said, don't you know, as excitable as these people get, they might have drunk it. He said, what would you have done if he'd drank that poison and it killed him right there? He said, I'd preach his funeral. <laughs> uh, so there's various ways to get over to people who don't know a thing more about the Bible, that they can't do what they claim they can do, and they don't have what they think they have. But I don't know that we have enough brethren bold enough to do that nowadays. 
They'd rather love them to the point of letting them go ahead and do that rather than embarrass somebody. You know, the truth sometimes is an embarrassing thing. Truth can really cut you right and left. We don't recognize that about the nature of truth. We appreciate much Brother Hill's lesson on the fatal error on the nature and purpose of miracles. And now we're going to dismiss for the morning session and be back here.